He learned one thing just then, isn't it? Open design's not as easy as it seems. I'm going to wander around. I'm not going to sit in a chair just yet. But I wonder how we want to kick this discussion off. We have 40 minutes, or maybe 35, because I think this audience needs a five minute break before the next uh, talk. So we have 35 minutes. Okay, being realistic, we have half an hour then. So, what do we do in those 30 minutes? Um, maybe I'll ask one of the audience to kick off with a question that's just been burning them so much, uh, they want to get it out. And you can address it to any of the panelists, or to somebody in the audience if you want. Who would like to lead off with a question? If not, I have about 50 here, but that's not the point. So, who's got a question? There's, there's two at the back. And actually, I've noticed that the microphone hasn't got up to the back much in this conference. So, there's two there with burning questions. Perhaps we can get the mic at the back there, can we? There's two ladies on the second row. Put your hands up again so, so the gentleman can see where you are. So, are you ready? I think you're going to get quite a few questions. And by the way, if you want to ignore the audience, and we did the talking last time too, it's open design, you know, she goes here. It's, it's not Queensbury boxing rules. Hola. Okay, thank you. First question. Um, can I just say too to all the Spanish speaking audience, thank you that we're doing this predominantly in English. Gracias. Eh, bueno, es una pregunta para, para Aitor, que me he quedado con, con ganas un poco de saber eh, si tu visión, ¿no? No, estamos hablando un rato de, de diseño abierto, si un poco imaginando ¿no? lo que tú podrías decir, si es un, el diseño abierto es este que, que un poco se cuestiona ¿no? estas normas de las que estábamos hablando que ya damos como, como por presupuestos ¿no? dentro del, del diseño práctico en este diseño. Uh, could we just get a very brief English summary that I didn't have my uh, system on? I will put it on. Can somebody just do it? Viviana, would you mind just giving a... Ah, uh, okay. So, could you just give a very brief indication of what that question was in English? Uh. Can you repeat? <laughs> <laughs> I can try in English. <laughs> okay. But the, my question was about if uh, the idea of ITER about open design, it, it runs in the way of uh, uh, open design was something without uh, those rules that which he was talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my <laughs> Okay, so, so I think the question is really about the rules. <laughs> I, I think the basic question is about the rules, you know. Uh, could we have a translation for ITOR? Thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is a fantastic system that involves the translators. It's called Open Conversation. Realmente hay dos eh, tipos de estrategias, eh, una es, eh, eh, dos clases de estrategias. La primera es acerca de la elaboración de un lenguaje desficcionalizado, en donde he renunciado a la postproducción y, y en donde he tratado de hacer las cosas accesibles de manera muy sincera. Eh, y la segunda es una estrategia de producción colaborativa de identidad, en donde Uh, he tratado de eh, estructurar un sistema de producción de identidad, para, eh, de, de diseño de identidad, en donde los elementos centrales que componen la identidad visual de una, de una empresa o de, de, de un grupo para el que tú estás trabajando pueden ser intervenidos por las periferias. De modo que eh, en diseño de identidad tradicional tendríamos una jerarquía piramidal de, de mando dentro de la, de la empresa y el diseñador lo que hace es obedecer a esa jerarquía y hace un diseño autoritario, hace un diseño eh, impositivo y dice nosotros somos así. Sin embargo, en, en la otra modalidad eh, 
hay todo un rango que sería más largo de explicar, pero consiste en que eh, la propia identidad puede ser modificada por cualquier parte que interviene dentro de la organización para la que se diseña. Esas son mis dos, mis dos estrategias, una relacionada con, la, con, la, con la, el lenguaje y otra con la producción de identidad visual. Pero, claro, eh, lo siento, pero no he podido eh, llegar a todo esto. Ok, I'm going to do a little bit of the translation there for those of the various categories you've identified. But I mean, I think if I can summarize your points, I thought you were saying that first of all, we have to defictionalize the language. You have to make sure that people can understand it, it's not beyond their understanding. And then you have to allow them in to help them modify the language. So, but this issue of language is coming up again and again. And what happened in the last four talks, I think, is uh, an idea that was growing with me is this idea of permission. So, permission, uh, giving people permission to join in open design, giving people permission to modify it, then feeling okay about it. So we maybe pick up on this, Victor, do you think uh, your people in India who are just making things because they need them, essentially, necessity maybe, do you think they worry about these things like permission to make and permission to... Eso está, está muy bien, muy bien, bueno, voy a dejar de terminar a mis compañeros, me parece una pregunta más, ¿no? ¿Tú querías contestar? Yeah. Bueno. <risa> <risa> okay. No, no, me simplemente decir que es un comentario muy, acert muy acertado, hay dentro de, de este modelo hay dos maneras de construir la identidad, una, digamos, dos extremos opuestos en el que habría un eje, un continuo, en el de posicionarse, uno, uno de los extremos es la... Eh, de consolidación de la identidad por sedimentación, es decir, cuando la identidad no está en absoluto programada, no hay un diseñador ni hay un equipo técnico que diga cómo es una identidad visual, que son los casos en los que está eh, Alistair, y la, el otro extremo es la producción de identidad uh, utilitaria tal como el diseñador está acostumbrado a programar y a planificar. ¿eh? Dentro de ese, de ese rango pues hay, hay muchísimas opciones en función de los objetivos de cada situación. ¿no? Efectivamente, no es una cuestión tampoco de, de, de permiso, sino más es una cuestión de control, ¿no? de cuando las empresas necesitan controlar qué es lo que se hace. Esto es. So maybe I'm going to um, a few examples that may be related to this or not. Um, but in particular in India, in particular, I'm going to the idea of uh, visual arts or graphic design, if you call it. Um, it's just this picture that they're called uh, track, arts, track artists. And they basically did paint the vehicles in a very open way as well. And another figure that um, is very common is the, the painters in the world. So basically they paint uh, commercial logos on um, every road, which is something very funny because obviously they make it slightly different every time. You can see it's huge Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola, which look like it's slightly wrong. What happened is that when, when Coke actually uh, tried to do to man for many years in, in, in India, Coca-Cola, when they really started to, to, to open a new market, they realized they really had to hire these guys in order to adapt the, the visual language to the, to the local kind of culture because they were used to kind of this a low fidelity kind of reproduction of, of something that theoretically has to be really perfect. I don't know if that is kind of the one. But this, this adaption is perhaps important because if I look at the work that you're doing, Alan, and the work that you're doing, Ronan, you're both suggesting a certain form of adaptation, but how would you, how do you place your work in with adaptation, where does adaptation fit? Because I think this is a common theme that, that uh, Victor and Michael have been talking about, adaptation. So where does it fit with your work? However you want to use the word. Um, and I would like it to happen as, as much as possible, you know, and, I'm, and I'm, when I do something, I mean, the, the field is more, let's say, traditional product design. I come from there, and adaptation is, is completely not acceptable in, in usual uh, product design. Actually, the product is the end of the process; it's not the beginning of the process with uh, interacting with, with users or, 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 or customers, whatever. And uh, my suggestion is: please download, please use, please do, please make mistakes, please make monsters, please whatever. Um, I would really like to happen, but. but the strange thing is that um, uh, it's not strange. Actually, I, at the beginning, I was surprised. That not many people do things. Uh, not many people of uh, not many people actually reproduce it or, or do variations of it. 
First, I, I said it with the. Do you, do you want to test that out? How many people would download Ronan's, uh, one of Ronan's folding chairs? Because they need a new chair. The, the let's, just, let's just test this straight out. The folding the chair. The chair. Who would download it? So we've got about, uh, I don't know, maybe 7%, exactly. That's not 7%, okay. So you've downloaded it. How many of you, keep your hands up, if you sit down, keep your hands up. How many of those would actually then go on to modify that design? Make it nice and round. Okay, so people the same number. Perfect. Well, the conclusion I come to is that not a normal audience. But how many would pay 250 euros to produce it? Sorry? How many would pay 250 to produce it? Okay, let's ask that question. How many would pay 250 to produce it? Yeah? <laughs> One. Um, adaptation help. I mean, how do you see that in your work? Because actually you gave us a script which is fixed. It so is fixed. I thought your comments might be needed here. Mm -hmm. The script for the embroidery is absolutely fixed. There's a we are the makers in a sense. Mm -hmm. Where do you, do you see adaptation in there somewhere? Well, there's the challenge of translation. So, um, uh, when we stitched the term yarn in Sweden, we translated the text into Swedish. And we did this collectively, because it's a poetic text, it's very difficult to <laughs> translate metaphor. And so we wrote the text on a big whiteboard, and we wrote it in Swedish, uh, English on one side, Swedish on the other, and then over a two-day period, people in, in Humlab, which is a digital humanities research lab, came and scribbled out and wrote and edited and changed the translation. Um, and through that discussion, we discovered uh, similar and different metaphors of thread and connectivity. So the thread in English, we describe the thread of an idea or the thread of a story or the thread of an argument. In Swedish, it has a colour. It's a red thread, and we don't we don't describe it a colour in English. So those kinds of distinctions between um, metaphor came out through that conversation. So I, actually, the work originated through a conversation about pluralistic mm -hmm. linguistics, plural views. So we may be doing that anyway. Maybe we shouldn't worry too much about the language, but we should worry about the starting point, perhaps, of the design. And this is, this is one thing that's concerning me. Uh, how do we decide to do an open design? And I'd like to talk to the audience here. What's the starting point of an open design? We have an idea. Rob Ronan had an idea for a bowl, and he, he went ahead and created the design and did it. But what, what is the starting point for open design? Can it also be anything? Has anybody got a thought on that? What is the starting point for open design? Is there somebody got their hand? Somebody shout yes? Yeah? Can we have a mic over to the lady at the back? Thanks. It can be a question or a thought, because we don't necessarily have to ask these guys. Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I think that uh, probably the starting point is a need. So, from my uh, social issue or economical issue or whatever, uh, starts with mm, this person because they have a need. A need. Something is needed. Something is needed. Yeah. Who feels we should start that conversation around the table when something's needed? How do we know what's needed? Let's give our panel a little bit can, more time. Can, can, I, can I answer this? Yes. this question? I mean, yes, something has to be needed and something has... I mean, I started to think about how to be independent and be creative without then somebody controlling it or stopping it or regulating it. After I was heartbroken, for the fifth time from, from an Italian producer. And I realized that, that uh, I cannot wait anymore and I cannot give somebody the control over my creativity, my career, my work, my mood, my whatever. It's, it's, it's unacceptable. And this kind of crisis I had uh, pushed me into, into a direction that I have to find the way to do things. So it's a very personal need then. Yeah. How, how did you get involved in this, Victor? I mean, do you have a personal need, or did you look at other people's needs, or what, what's driving you looking at all these different ways of Interesting question. materializing? I think um, because of my education, somehow I was also trained as a film designer, but uh, I was a very bad student. I wasn't really interested in producing and, and selling food as such. So I was always kind of doing the same thing. I didn't really have to really find something that was interesting. On the other side, 
I have to say that for many years so I was very, very critical. You know, I was like, oh, but, you know, this is not. And, and now I'm becoming completely the different round. You know, if, if something is actually done, it's good enough. You know, in that, in that sense, you know, because it has a value for somebody. You know? So somehow, you know, after the year, you, you start to kind of relax on um, that sense. You know, and, I mean, there's some reason, if only you know, for you to make a living. I think needs change over time as well and change through the life of a project. And my project started with a need to find a uh, literary and critical language for looking at the way in which we use digital technologies in a media lab that was very focused on digital innovation and gaming as a form of industry development in the northeast of Sweden. And so to um, reintroduce a or introduce a a more uh, philosophical and poetic discourse into the actual tools that we were using seemed to be really important. So my project grew out of that need. I would argue that it's been sustained through the need for, uh, again, a critical language to be um, discussed within crafter and maker movements. You know, I have a whole paper about how I hate knitted cake, which is the kind of counter argument to um, the disempowering function of craft, the political disempowerment of women through refashioning um, 1950s feminism, femininity through craft today. But this, this maybe gives us a real thing to concentrate on with open design here. How do we go and find these needs? You've travelled in communities, you've travelled in communities, I'm not sure, I don't, I'm sure you have too, but if we go into other communities, run into you, work in other communities, you, you find another language, don't you? Another culture. So, do we... This is an open question if anybody on the panel wants to, to answer it, or anyone in the audience who wants to answer it. Um, you know, do we need to go and find the real needs for open design? Otherwise, we just end up doing another kind of design that doesn't really meet real needs. I think they're in front of us, and I think our inability to reconfigure the seating in here just shows not only our mythology around the technology preventing us from do, doing that, which I'm is actually this, the case. I'm moving this one now. If we, we stay with our chairs, we're okay. You can't be separate from your chair. <laughs> but uh, it's, we're, we're so um, constrained by convention and tradition, um, whether it's a seating layout, whether it's a set of expectations around how the market works, and sometimes it takes a shift in geography or a shift in politics or a shift in a social space to look at your own conditions and the conditions in front of you and you, whether yeah. that's in your home but or somewhere else. Let's bring Aitor in because he wanted to make an observation here. Cómo uno llega a desear una cosa o llega a desear la, la siguiente, cómo uno acaba construyendo de una manera a sí mismo. Es decir, no se trata de saber si unas necesidades son reales, si existen o si han sido producidas artificialmente, sino se trata de por qué camino hemos llegado a desear unas cuestiones y otras. He escuchado, por ejemplo, eh, en otras eh, intervenciones hablar. Eh, que han cambiado eh, paradigmas diciendo, bueno, es que ahora el, 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 ya no hay consumidores y, 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 y productores, sino que hay prosumidores, que, que se aglutina en una, en una misma persona la acción de producir y consumir, cuando, y parece que todo eso tiene una, un, un, un valor social, cuando en realidad estamos eh, reproduciendo, estamos especiando absolutamente la, la dinámica de comportamiento del, del mercado. Es decir, Yo cuando estoy hablando, no estoy produciendo palabras y tú estás consumiendo palabras. Esto no es así. No es así. Sin embargo, cuando estamos hablando de diseñar, sí, estamos, seguimos hablando de consumidores y estamos perpetuando la misma manera de ser, la misma manera que nos hace desear unas determinadas cosas, que son las cosas que el mercado quiere que nosotros deseemos. Esa es la cuestión. No si las necesidades son, son eh, reales o si son artificiales, sino por qué hemos llegado a tenerlas y cuáles han sido, han sido los caminos que nos han llevado. I think I'd take that one for the audience. Are your, needs, are your needs imposed by the market? If you agree, put your hand up. Okay. There's not much agreement there, I thought, I'm afraid. But I know what you mean. You're saying that we are highly conditioned because words are repeated in the media again and again and again and again. Um, it's interesting, at the end of the news program, the national news program, you always get the figures about the stock exchange, don't you, as if it's some kind of ultimate truth. And then it makes the news really serious, because they gave these figures at the end. I don't know where this is going exactly, but uh, 
Okay, so if your needs aren't driven by the market, can you tell us a little bit um, needs? Or we use an exercise often. We ask people in co-design workshops, what are your dreams? And they'll tell you. They'll tell you big dreams, small dreams. So maybe we're asking the wrong question. So it's that thing about questions, isn't it? Because that's also kind of controlling the language a bit. Ronan, you want to come in? Showed a few slides, and you showed uh, global warming, and you showed uh, some other crises coming: peak oil, peak materials, uh, water, everything. Um, I think I think we're going to have like a perfect storm, and I think part of the solution is networks. Networks would find a way to uh, distribute uh, energy resources, so on and so on. Open design in this way is a suggestion on how uh, solutions in, in, in the form of products can uh, go from place to place in a, in a, in a crisis situation. There's, there's open design, and this is just a thought that's flitted through my head. And then we need to create a platform where people can say, these are my dreams, these are my feelings, this is how I think the world's changing. And then we have that information and we can actually say, okay, we can start to do some designing around that. Would that be a good idea? If we said this is an open design platform where we, we want to hear what you feel, we want to hear what your needs are, we want to hear your new language, the neo lengua. We want to hear these things so we can start working with you to do something together. Is that what we need? A platform for language more than a platform for I don't think the CNC people, machine. I don't think that people know so much what they need. I mean, you know the the, the saying attributed to Henry Ford if if I asked people what they want, they would want a faster world. You know, this aren't, aren't we contesting that in open design? Aren't we saying, yeah, any color you can or want, doesn't have to be black, you design the color. Aren't we saying that it's, isn't it the reverse of what Henry Ford said? I, I think, yeah. Isn't it the reverse of what Henry Ford said? I, I, don't, I really don't think people know what they want. Okay, I think what about out here? I think there are some geniuses in, in companies or individuals anyway uh, with a vision that provide people with, with something that they say, oh, this is what I want. Okay, but maybe we know what we feel. That's a bit easier. Is a lady in the back there? Most. It can be a question, thought, statement, anything you want. Okay, uh, yeah, hello, my name is Katarina. Um, I think it's really important uh, that people start remembering what they dream about and articulate what they dream about because uh, when we ask people what they need, maybe in the first place it's, it's a bit difficult to come up with what we really want and what we need, but uh, when we remember how to dream and uh, then I think it's different things than faster horses or bigger cars. Um, what do you think about that? Who's forgotten how to dream? We can turn the question around. Or who remembers how to dream? Do we have any dreams left here? Or are we just sort of, you know, wandering along? We must have a dream, surely. We all have dreams, but we're looking at a very narrow band of choice and need here. I mean, if you're asking, yeah. you know, the kids in India, what do they need in a particular village and they're, you know, impromptu building things that they need, whether that's a form of play, which is not so far away from some of your playful um, toy-like objects, um, it's, it, that's very different to saying in open design you can ch choose the colour of your toothbrush or whatever, the colour of your car. You know, these are. Um, but aren't the issues a little bit big, bigger than the colour of your toothbrush? Yeah, absolutely. I that's mean, why I'm saying we need to be very clear about the spectrum of choices that we're making, why we're making them. It's not. It's not simple. You can't simply say this is about whether you can articulate your desire. You know here in Barcelona right now, or you know, in Berlin, or in Delhi. That each uh, context has a different set of constraints and a different set of uh, parameters to need. It's only when we understand how those uh, needs connect up between different places or how they impact on each other that you can understand the implications of your need or your want or your desire. So we, we're describing them as these sort of separate shopping choices, which is banal, surely. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to the panelists now to see if they want to ask any questions. Yes, sorry, we have a question in the back there. It doesn't, yeah. 
I think uh, what people need is all of us. We need to be creative. We are creative. Sometimes we are not. We don't are. We are not creative enough to be geniuses, but we like to be part of the team that one helps the other, and you get ideas from uh, one and another, and then you can co-create things. It's not what you need to use, but you need to use your head to engage in the adventure of uh, improve what's around you. I think this is very important for everybody so in all cultures. We need social relations then, essentially, don't we? We need to feel sure. like we're building something with others, that we're and to be talking with others. And to feel that we, uh, our ideas are uh, add to other ideas. Okay, and then I think somebody else wants to join in down there. Yeah, I think um, when you talk about needs, uh, it's actually quite a global thing. Um, I mean, we're all humans, we are pretty much all the same. We all dream about similar things, about conviviality, about being with families, and about having a secure life and um, being protected and having food and all these things. So I think in the end, uh, it's not that constrained about the, uh, the context uh, when we really think about our real needs. Um, and I think we really have to relearn how to think about our real needs and how to how to phrase them. And maybe being very open as to what those might be. Let, let's just have leave the last sort of uh, five ten minutes here, maybe for discussion between the panel, or some questions that you've had uh, floating through the conference. So uh, I thought uh, I wanted to start off. Yeah, Disculpáis, pero eh, Afer, la creatividad es un invento también de las industrias culturales. Es decir, eh, no hay ninguna diferencia, es muy difícil eh, hacer una distinción objetiva entre una actividad que consideramos creativa de una que no lo es. Solamente el, el simple hecho de eh, componer eh, una, una frase, eh, ese, ese, ese hecho se invierte en una cantidad de lo que llamamos creatividad impresionante. Eh, cualquier disciplina eh, necesita de una creatividad. Sin embargo, eh, estamos eh, etiquetando el diseño de las disciplinas que están eh, interviniendo en el ámbito de la cultura, en el ámbito, en el ámbito de la producción simbólica sobre todo, a, como, como creativas. Eh, ¿Por qué? Porque esto eh, lo que produce es la capacidad de capitalización del término, de una capitalización simbólica que luego es muy fácil de rentabilizar en forma de prestigio, en forma de, de, de sobredimensión, en fin, hay, hay diversos mecanismos. Pero en mi opinión, lo de la creatividad eh, o no existe o está distribuido en absolutamente todas las zonas de nuestra existencia. Es así. Gracias. Creativity is everywhere. You don't have to actually name it; it exists. Okay, let's move on. Victor, uh, thoughts, a question, maybe question for the audience. Um, Anything you want? Just to pick up and to continue with uh, with this conversation. That I think, anyway, it's it's really philosophical. I mean, maybe it's yes. way beyond of any. We, so we can make it practical, though. Or yes. Other things. But specifically about this issue of, of needs and so on, one to add two things is is definitely a crucial. Um, bias, and I think um, it really connects with what uh, my daughter was mentioning today. In other cultures, there is not this need, um, this famous pyramid of uh, Maslow, Maslow, and, uh, where you are supposed to cover your basic needs before you move on on higher uh, intellectual, uh, I mean, this is not true in every culture. In other no, cultures, not. they, they, they no. think they can be happy when they're very poor. This is really beyond, you know, my, my, my scope here, you know, but definitely, something to do you know, with the uh, material status you know, that you're supposed to get in this society. You know, which, and, and this I try to blame also you know, for this particular view on, on how to be happy you know, with any specific you know, material possession. But Manfred Max Nick talks about needs as satisfiers, pseudo-satisfiers, destroyers. Yeah. So and he had a much more specific view, I think, than yeah. my opinion. But... And, and the other view of this, um, in your review also showed when the good old lady actually is present in her creativity that says maybe to agree you know, with what I was saying, you know, being, being creative, even if you don't have nice, it is also a way of, of being happy. You know, pretty much. We should think of everyday life as a creative uh, adventure, maybe. And you can continue the conversation, add something new, disagree, 
Or you can pass. I'll pass. <laughs> Running. You know, I read something uh, very cool on Facebook. Somebody put it. Mm. It's, it's, uh, uh, the question of what is happiness? And uh, the answer is happiness is sustainable optimism. Uh, and, I, and I think that there is some truth in that. Um, because because um, the more I go through life and my career and through my experiences, uh, the more I, I, I'm losing my faith in, 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 in human society. And, and the only thing that keeps me optimistic, and maybe there is a, a chance, is the younger generation. Um, I think my generation that grew with uh, wild capitalistic, uh, let's make money, uh, you know, doesn't matter what, let's make money out of it, uh, is, is uh, we, we made the world as it is, for good and for bad. And I think that uh, the younger generation is much more aware, much more informed, much more uh, curious, and much more uh, open to accept all kinds of new ideas. They are the internet generation. And okay. I think this is, this is the... Although there's quite a range of ages here in the room, and I think that if you go back to something I talked about on the first day, um, can I just ask you a quick question in the audience? How many, how many of you are sort of uh, under 25 here? Okay, so we've got a, under 25. We've got a relatively small number of young people here, but I have a big concern with that. that you know, we talked about the future of young people in Spain without work, one in four people. There's a need, surely. There's a need. There's some people who might like to create some new language, some people who might like to invent things and play with things and, and actually to substantially improve that day just by being creative, whatever that is, during that day. So isn't that an agenda we could gather around? I mean, can't we collectively say that's a good need to address the, the future of young people? And then we have a question, how do we involve them? There's only a few here today, so I'm going to ask the young people here, how do we involve you more? How, how is, I mean, how, how in your opinion, um, how, how do young people uh, work with open design? Can you see it as a benefit for them for creating new kinds of work, new, new ways of living? The question should be, do you want to uh, grow up in a better world and, and, and you would be more happy and creative and, you know, the, the society that is is going to emerge in the next uh, 10, 20 years. Okay, but we have something to do with it. Would you like to be uh, uh, involved? But we're here at an open design conference, so it seems yeah. quite reasonable to ask the question. Uh, open design is the How can open design, design work uh, in this situation? So, in, any young person here, or younger person, I should say, there's a lady over here on the right with the blue t shirt. In fact, one of the helpers, I think, has been working hard on the tapestry project. Hello, I'm Sarah, and I don't know, this is really big for me, this conference, but I'm learning a lot. But I think that, in my opinion, that I'm young and I see the future and in Spain, that I'm from Barcelona, I think that the things didn't have been done well. So I think that it's nice to cooperate and to listen to other people and to know if you are mistaken or the other people is mistaken and to find a global solution to do things better because I think that the things haven't done good and that's why we are like this. That's why you're here. Okay. Do you have any thoughts about uh, uh, a way of getting young people more involved in this conversation about open design or simply designing differently if we don't want to use open design? Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, I think like, you know, like being together and not feeling alone, you know, because I feel really little here, you know, this is a lot of terms that I don't know and that thing like to be together and have a topic and analyze this topic and go step by step, you know, is a way to go. Then I think uh, Pat and all of us need your suggestions and other young people as to how that can be enabled, how it can happen faster and in a larger way, so thank you for your contribution there. Okay. Okay, we're well, moving into last thoughts because we need a five minute break before we have our final keynote today. So I would just ask the panel, do you have a last thought or?
wish. She might be like, yes, a drink or something like that. But I wanted to uh, come back on this question of permission that you asked right at the beginning. And I think um, when I look at the artists and curators that I work with, in mostly in London, they have gone beyond the point of asking permission in terms of copyright. And um, there's still a bit of nervousness around it at the edges, but the predominant kind of uh, energy or the motivation for making is is not to acknowledge uh, copyright or, or restrictions on or rules on the use of images or designs, materials, any cultural material. It feels like we've um, transcended. I mean, the, the the copy and paste function of the internet, the the ubiquity of digital uh, tools and computing. It's it's like you know, plastic bottles, you can convert them into anything. Digital files, you can convert them into anything. Permission There's no an issue. hierarchy of, of permission or but objects I, anymore. I think I wasn't asking about asking for permission, but mm -hmm. encouraging people by giving permission, which is maybe a different end of things, or maybe not. Well, then you're assuming a position of power to enable that to happen. The permission, yes, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. It could be an erroneous one. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I thought, that last thought. Uh, we can get you to sketch it if you want. We can get you to draw it. <laughs> but a, a quick last thought. No, simplemente eh, insistir o subrayar el hecho de que eh, para construir un diseño abierto necesitamos contemplar la vertiente del lenguaje, que es una parte eh, francamente olvidada en todo nuestro pensamiento. De, de producción distribuida y el lenguaje es con lo que nosotros trabajamos es nuestra herramienta, el lenguaje gráfico simplemente quería subrayarlo para que estemos un poquito más atentos a este tema I mean, one worry I have is about, you know, if everything is available digitally you know, where's the analog gone? because we need that balance too you know. Victor um, Yeah, maybe my last thought uh, Maybe to mention that, um, from my perspective, um, yeah, again, you know, open design, um, we call it as you name it, but uh, at the end, you know, what you're trying to do is, is uh, really consider, you know, the social and ethical implications of what you're doing and try to add some value, you know, beyond um, economic value. So this can be done anywhere and everywhere. And, you know, today the examples I show, um, maybe because they're more exotic, you know, you, you are able to see them with different eyes, but I think it is all around us, and you can find here in the street, in the countryside, you know, the, um, all the people, you know, who really values, you know, the, um, you know, objects and so on. So, um, at least as a professor, as an educator here, you know, what I really try to, to when I show you these kind of examples, you know, to students, is really, really think uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it, and really, you know, who is going to, 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 to take some benefit from it. I think this is really the big question here, and the, the reason to be open. Yeah. Right, so, so, and so social value and who who win? Yeah. Well, Roman, well, very, quick, very quick point. Extremely quick. Uh, it was not really discussed uh, in this uh, conference, and I think it's ethics. Uh, the ethics of open design are, are very different than the ethics, ethics of industrial design or mass production. Uh, you actually control, or actually you know what will be the conditions of production and consumption of, of the product you are releasing as an open design, uh, in contrast to, 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 to the, the same normal uh, format. And um, this is new, and this is this is um, something that should be uh, stressed more. In a way. It's not only green or sustainable; it's ethical. Well, that's a good point to end this uh, discussion on to thank all the panelists for their contribution. It's clear that open design is in some form of transitional practice, and I think we're all interested in that transition, at least we can perhaps all agree on that. The transition process is fascinating. Thank you also for your contribution, and thanks for the four speakers, and please show your appreciation.